Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. This is Lecture 7 in Week 5, where we're really dealing with chromatography, in particular gas chromatography. And what we're going to be talking about in this mini lecture is a very simple question, which is how do you decide the features of a GC process? We've talked a lot about flow rate earlier in the week as one parameter to manipulate and improve resolution, but what about things related specifically to the column selection? Many features of the column selection play a huge role in how good the separation is going to be. So in your reading this week under the resources page, you'll find information from a couple of companies on GC column selection, and that will be required reading for you. This particular poster is taking from a company called ResTech, which makes GC capillary columns. And I think it summarizes very nicely the kinds of things you need to do and to think about. The first is you only need to make a separation as good as it needs to be. So if you're really only going to have one peak out of your analysis, maybe you don't need to go to huge lengths to get really, really, really good resolution. But if you've got a lot of peaks and you'll be quantitating closely spaced peaks, well then of course you're going to have to make the separation extremely efficient or have very, very narrow widths. You're going to be selecting a stationary phase. One way to get peaks to separate is to choose a stationary phase that interacts with one of your analytes differently than another. You're going to be thinking about the length of the column. Longer columns, as you know, will give better resolution. The inner diameter of the column has a really interesting parameter, and it controls a lot about the separation process. But there's also some trade-offs if you make it too small. And finally, the thickness of the stationary phase that coats the capillary column. All of these factors will matter and will play into what decision you ultimately make about your separation. So let's start with the resolution equation. So this is a standard resolution equation. We saw it last week, more or less similar form. And just to remind you, alpha is equal to TB over TA. So that's kind of how different in time do the two analytes come out. And remember, you can't define resolution without defining two analytes. It's the difference between two peaks. And part of resolution is the efficiency of the separation. How broad are the peaks? The next part is how separated are they? And those two factors are really going to be the kinds of things you manipulate in order to have a really good separation. So let's first talk about stationary phase selection. We went over this in the last lecture, so I'll just hit it quickly. This is a different approach. You see a lot of more column materials listed. And you can buy columns made with any of these stationary phases. And what you're looking at is kind of a normalized retention index that helps you compare how those columns may behave with different kinds of analytes. Starting at the top, that's the most polar. It's most nonpolar. Going to the bottom is the most polar. So usually if you're doing a separation, you should start with your most nonpolar columns. They'll be the most rugged and the most able to withstand high temperatures, which you often need to pull everything off the column. Then you're going to be looking at the analytes you're interested in. So let's say we were interested in separating butane and butanol. If you look at this graph, you can sort of see which might be good columns. So a bad column would be polydimethylsiloxane, the one at the top, because they come out at exactly the same time. But a really good column, I'll give you a second to find one, is actually the one at the bottom. They come out at really, really different times. Polyethylene glycol is a polar column, and that's picking up the polarity difference between benzene and butanol. The only challenge is it may not have the temperature stability you might need, depending on the other things that are present. And so the maximum operating temperature, sometimes called the MAOT or MOAT, are things that you're going to see listed and discussed in all of your reading material. So that's not really listed here, but it's something that does play a role, as I said, depending on what your other terms are, or your other analytes, rather. The next decision is your inner diameter. As you recall, capillary columns are all going to be under one millimeter inner diameter, but they could be 0.5 or they could be 0.1. So really, smaller inner diameters mean better resolution, and that's because of the mass transfer term, as you're going to see in a second. But it also means slower separations. So here's some general column characteristics based on the ID of the column. So the first thing I want you to notice, there's a whole bunch of different gases. Don't worry about why the gases go at different flow rates. But as you go from 0.53 IDs to 0.1s, you have to slow down your flow rates. The reason for that is that as you go to a smaller and smaller diameter, you need to apply more of a pressure in order to get your stuff through the system. And you just can't apply that much pressure. And so you have to slow down your flow rates when you go to smaller diameters. 
And the other thing you'll notice is sample loading capacity. That's actually one of the drawbacks of a very, very small ID capillary column. You really can't load a lot of sample in it, which means you're going to have to have an extremely good detector. Finally, of course, the huge advantage is the theoretical plates. So you can have enormous, enormous resolution with a small ID column because it's going to be 30 meters long. And so take that 11,000 and multiply it by 30, and you get really, really high numbers of theoretical plates in really practical GC columns. And that's really what drives people to use those really tiny ID columns. Typically, if you're not really having to knock yourself out for resolution, you might go to a 0.53 because you don't pay all of those prices that you do with a really tiny ID column. The film thickness is the thickness of the stationary phase on the inner part of the tube. And, you know, that's often listed and you're going to sort of see two different things. You'll either see super, super thin, thin films or you're going to see films that are much thicker. All the thicker films are always more rugged, although it's not listed here. And you can kind of go through the trade-offs. Basically, the thinner the film, the better the resolution. And that's all because of that mass transfer term. You're going to have really rapid equilibration when you have a very, very thin stationary phase. And finally, column length. Column length, I think, is intuitive. I hope by now, as you move your material through a longer and longer column, you're going to have more separations happening or more theoretic, more plates um, active on your separation. And that's going to ultimately lead to more resolution. However, you pay some prices. First off, you're going to have to, again, apply more pressure to the system. You're going to have longer retention times, which means you're going to have longer separations. So, for example, if you're in a lab that has to do a lot of samples every day, you're going to want those separations to be really rapid. You're not going to want to wait two or three hours to get your full data set. But definitely, as you go to longer columns, you get better resolution, as reflected here, in seeing a higher number of theoretical plates. I wanted to make one note about carrier gas. I sort of said earlier that carrier gas is not usually a strong knob that you turn when you do gas chromatography. You might think about what to use, but I wanted to bring it up because it's going to help illustrate a couple of items related to both the selection of the inner diameter and the thickness of the stationary phase. So these are Van Diemter plots for actually three different carrier gases or mobile phases. And what's maybe interesting to you is that they're actually extraordinarily different. So even though hydrogen, helium, and nitrogen are doing nothing more than simply pushing the analyte through the column, they actually have a big impact on how fast the separation can be. So for example, if you're using hydrogen, you're going to be able to go at much, much greater speeds and still get the same basic resolution as if you were using nitrogen. And if you look at the plots, you'll notice that the nitrogen is actually got a much steeper curve out at rapid separations. So its mass transfer is really kicking in very quickly as compared to helium and hydrogen. And so it might make you think that you'd love to always use hydrogen when you do these separations. The problem with hydrogen as a selection for a gas is that it's actually pretty corrosive. It can, at especially high temperatures, react with a lot of other materials. It's particularly bad for GCMS where it can actually trash a lot of the oils that are used in the pumping systems for the mass spectrometer. So hydrogen you have to stay away from if you're using GCMS. It can actually be a good thing to use in other cases. But in any case, you can see that it really does matter. Mobile phase has a big difference and it plays a big role in that mass transfer term. So I just wanted to go over that and kind of give you one extra step of um, depth in that term. So if you recall, the mass transfer term, the thing that makes it hard to run at high speeds, is the fact that you have to get good equilibration between the solute, the analytes in the mobile phase and the stationary phase. And if you go too fast, they get out of sync and the peak broadens. So the mass transfer, actually, we had talked about it last time only as diffusion into the stationary phase. But there's also equilibration into the mobile phase. And in fact, both of those terms, particularly for very thin stationary phases, can become important. So for an open tubular column, both have to be considered. So the term over on the left, and so you see that the thickness of the stationary phase, or D, matters, as does the diffusion in the stationary phase. But you'll also see a new term, which is C sub M, which is related to the diffusion into the mobile phase from the stationary phase. And that's a really interesting one. It basically says, as the inner diameter gets bigger, then you have to diffuse more to fully equilibrate with the mobile phase. And in fact, the diffusion into the mobile phase matters. You want rapid diffusion for that to be a minimum. 
So that's one of the reasons actually that we see such good results with hydrogen is it actually it's such a light atom when you calculate diffusion in the mobile phase you're not calculating diffusion in a vacuum you're calculating the diffusion relative to the mobile phase and those light atoms move very rapidly as opposed to nitrogen for example and so that's actually one of the reasons that hydrogen and helium have that extra boost in terms of a lower mass transfer is actually that diffusion into the mobile phase can be better Okay, so I've gone over some of the factors that you have to consider when you're choosing um, particularly a column, but also a couple of other elements of a GC process. You have to think about the stationary phase and choosing a stationary phase that might distinguish between the two atoms that you hope to separate. Uh, the length of the column, if you've got, can run at high enough pressures, just run a long column, especially if you can wait some time. Uh, the inner diameter. Again, you're going to get really good resolution, but it's going to come at the cost of some important things. So you really don't necessarily want to use a tiny, tiny ID or inner diameter unless you absolutely need that kind of resolution. And finally, the thickness of the stationary phase. It's always good to go small, but again, you're going to have to have a pretty good detector because you're not going to have much material coming off the column. So those are some of the trade-offs that you have to think about when you finally design a GC separation. Thanks so much, and see you next time.